Welcome to the Workology Podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader. Join host Jessica Miller Merrill, founder of Workology.com, as she sits down and gets to the bottom of trends, tools, and case studies for the business leader, HR, and recruiting professional who is tired of the status quo. Now here's Jessica with this episode of Workology. Studies on organizational change show that leaders across the board agree. If you want to lead a successful transformation, communicating empathetically is critical. We touched on empathy in a recent podcast on design thinking with Dorothy Mankey, and empathy in the workplace is top of mind for those of us who are in HR today. Welcome to the Wikology podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Clear Company. Inspired by his 2019 South by Southwest session, it was titled A Crash Course in Empathy and Leadership. And I wanted to sit down with Michael Ventura. He's the CEO and founder of Sub Rosa and author of Applied Empathy, The New Language of Leadership. Michael, welcome to the Workology podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, let's talk a little bit about your, your South by Southwest session. I know you started your career as a successful young entrepreneur in interactive design, and you mentioned two things, your health and the recession um, collided, and you kind of had this wake-up call that led to a huge change in your personal and professional life. Can you kind of walk us through this and talk about how this led you to your empathy and leadership uh, topic and path? Yeah, sure. So I started the business which wasn't at the time called Sub Rosa in 2003. And in 2003, post the bubble bursting, uh, we basically were the young kids brought into organizations to tell them how to use digital in a way that felt authentic. And so we were in this weird time and place in history where we were a part of the core user group that many brands were trying to reach. And we also knew just enough to be a little dangerous and actually like uh, provide services to these organizations. And so we ended up being this interactive design studio doing, uh, which at the time meant really like flash websites, because if you remember that era of, of marketing, there, were, there was a lot of microsites and flash, uh, flash and macromedia that was being developed. And we did that work, but what we were really doing was helping brands start to think and act more hum- more like humans, more conversationally. And so our business grew pretty rapidly because everyone really needed that. And our counsel around both digital and social was really something that, um, that we could add value to, to an organization with. And so we went from a couple people to probably 40 people in the span of about 18 months. And the business got pretty unwieldy. And we were, at the time, 24, 25 years old, uh, my partner and I, and, uh, and weren't really equipped to be running a 40 person organization working with large fortune 100 brands and um, didn't have a lot of support, didn't have a lot of mentorship around us. And we're kind of just flying the plane um, a little blindly as we went, but we were producing enough good work that things seemed stable. And then fast forward to 2008 when the financial crisis hit and uh, our team really at that point started to, you know, the plane started to shake, so to speak, right? We were just going through a rocky patch of work. Um, clients were also pulling back on budgets. Everything started to get a little tenuous. And my partners at the time uh, had all decided around that point that they wanted to move on to do other things too. And that, you know, entrepreneurship in a, in a boom time is great. Entrepreneurship in, in, in a bust time is a little more stressful. And so we decided to break up the partnership. Around that same time, I was just married. I had been coping with a whole host of stresses from from this business for the past few years, had herniated three discs in my back, could barely walk, had insomnia, had anxiety. I mean, like the list goes on and on and on and on. And I took that as an opportunity to kind of reboot everything, right, to go back to zero and found a whole path of of wellness and alternative medicine that helped me get my mind and my body and my spirit back in alignment, but then also needed to get the business back in alignment. And so I started to have some conversations with our clients and I asked them, what is it that you need but don't get from your agency partners? And they all in one way or another said essentially the same thing. We have a lot of great consultants who can come in and say the right smart things because they're smart people and write great decks and give us great plans. 
But then we have to take that plan and we have to go sell it in and we have to get support and buy in from other divisions of this organization. Then we have to get budget. Then we have to write a brief. Then we have to find an agency. Then we have to brief them. Then we have to make sure that they understand this work that some other consulting firm did a few months ago. And then they have to go make a thing. And if all of that goes well, we live to fight another day. And so what we would much rather have is a partner who can recommend and do. And you guys have been on the doing side for the past few years with us. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to move upstream because this is a commodity business. And we can continue executing good design work. But I think the real value we can add is where we started, where we were sitting at the table and consulting with you about ways to act more like a human and ways to engage with people more meaningfully. And so I'd like to build out a consultative practice and I'd like to you know, use this relationship as a, a leaping off point for it. So let's have a pilot project together. And they all agreed. And these were big you know, Fortune, Fortune 100 organizations. And we started to build that out and ultimately became what Sabrosa is today, which is uh, a strategy and design practice that works through the idea of what we call applied empathy to solve problems and to change organizations for the better. And the last thing I'll say on that long soliloquy is that the, the idea of applied empathy for us is not good enough to just focus on the idea of empathy, but really how it applies to our actions as leaders our behaviors as uh, organizations and the way we set policies, the way we manage our teams, the way we build our cultures. And really it is in the application of empathy that the rubber really meets the road. And so that's why we called it that. Awesome. Well, you have answered like half my questions for the podcast, which is in, in one, in one response. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. It just makes me laugh. And uh, let's, let's kind of step back a second here and maybe get kind of your official definition of empathy. Because when I think about empathy, a lot of times people think it just means be nice or the golden, golden rule. So in your applied empathy kind of framework and model, what does that mean to you? Clinically, there are three types of empathy. There's what's called affective empathy uh, with an A, and that's what you just described. It's sort of like golden rule empathy. Like, you're sad. I've been sad before, too. When I was sad, this is how I wanted people to treat me. I'm going to treat you this way, right? Like, that's sort of the, the, the common connection to empathy. And, uh, and it does get some eyebrows raised when you go in an organization and you say that you work with empathy because most people think that's what you mean. And they think it's like, you're here to tell me to be nicer to people or to treat people the way I want to be treated. And while that shouldn't be such an eyebrow raiser and that we would wish that most people did act that way, that's not the form of empathy that we're talking about when we work with organizations. Um, the second is somatic empathy. So this is about feeling like genuinely embodying and feeling the way someone else feels or what someone else is going through. So a good example of that that I often give is uh, when a spouse has sympathy pains when, when their spouse is pregnant, right? That is also not the type of empathy we're pursuant of. The third um, is cognitive empathy. And this is about perspective taking. And that's really where we zeroed in in the development of applied empathy. And so our definition of the term is self-aware perspective taking to gain richer and deeper understanding. And self-aware is tough, obviously, because no one can be wholly self-aware. And if you were, you probably aren't working in marketing. But, you know, the, the, the truth is that we can be somewhat self-aware. We can know our biases. We can know our mood. We can know our, our self in this given moment decently and use that self-awareness and say, okay, I know this is where I'm at. And I'm now consciously stepping out of that and into the shoes of someone else in order to understand them better. And it's not just projecting in that we encourage people to do because that's still you're in control. What we ask people to do is do this through inquiry, do this through conversation, do this through discourse, because if you're just imagining what someone else was feeling, that's still you in the driver's seat. And ultimately what we want to get people doing with cognitive empathy is asking the hard questions so that they hear from the other side exactly how they truly feel so that they can understand them better. So how do you facilitate that applied empathy? Is it manager training and then the manager goes out individually and, and, and engages the team? I, I guess I'm trying to, in my mind, think about if I was a workplace leader, how I would be able to use this uh, in a larger setting, but also with the individuals that I'm working with every day. 
think of it a little bit like uh, any sort of design thinking curriculum, right? D design thinking doesn't have a process. It has a toolkit, right? And there are many methodologies and frameworks and, and uh, behaviors that one can adopt in order to solve a problem using design thinking. And we look at this very much the same way. So uh, what we've developed is a set of uh, methodologies and behaviors that will allow people to say, okay, in this moment, the right way to do this might be X or Y or Z, but you're right to say, sometimes it's just as simple as sitting down and having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with someone, asking them how they feel, right? Like that's, that doesn't take a lot of uh, intellect to do that on a, on a technical level, but it does take some EQ, right? It does take some, some training to sometimes get people who are not always comfortable having those types of conversations to sit down and, and intentionally have them and to be present and to be an active listener and to ask follow-up questions and to go deeper. And so, yes, sometimes the work we do is born out of training, um, training managers, training individuals to be able to take on this way of working and to pilot it in their teams. Um, it also sometimes takes the form of taking a look at how performance is evaluated, right? Do we need to reevaluate how people are um, are measured inside this organization? What's the performance criteria for getting a promotion? How are their peers' inputs uh, influencing that, not just their uh, direct reports? You know, all of these types of things start to become part and parcel of building an ecosystem where empathy can thrive. This is so fascinating to me. And, and you know, you mentioned that you've worked with some really well-known brands on the creative process focused on empathy in the workplace. Is, is there a common thread that you found in the work with some of those employers and workplaces? I would say that at a large scale organizational level, one of the things that is often more true than not is that the, through no fault of anyone's, the silos and the divisions that have been put up to allow for efficient management of work product have also led to the inefficient uh, ability to connect to each other, right? People work in their division. People have very clear understanding of their reporting lines and their responsibilities and their OKRs and KPIs and all the other acronyms that people care about. But what they don't often realize is that it is the integration of all of those divisions into one thing that breeds a culture. And that if we're not working together, if we're not collaborating, if we're not asking those types of questions, then we've got a bunch of really autocratic fiefdoms, but we don't have a, uh, but we don't have a, a, a real living, breathing organism. And so part of what we do inside these organizations is from the get go, have to get buy-in from the top that this has to be more than a, a marketing initiative or a human resources initiative. This needs to be an organizational initiative to really affect the right type of change. So I just got off the phone, and he will remain nameless, uh, but I was talking with uh, someone that I've connected with, and he works for a large Fortune 50 company, and one of, I think, his buzz biggest frustrations is just the disconnect between him and his manager. He kind of has a big personality and a lot of ideas. How does someone like that maybe utilize the applied empathy to sort of, I guess, manage up and uh, build those relationships. I think one of the things that's helpful is for them to understand what is it that is the motivator, the motivators or the drivers of that person they're reporting into, right? Because if the disconnect is because this person is ambitious and audacious and has big ideas and they feel like they're being squelched or stymied, by the person that they report into, that might be because that per that person's role or the person that that person reports into uh, is expecting something different. Like I'll give you an example. So we have a uh, a client who went through a pretty seismic merger, and there was a leadership team about two rungs down from the C-suite who were excited about this merger because they said, now we can, like, our combined forces, we can do all this great stuff we've been wanting to do, but now we've got, you know, we've got the capital to do it, we've got the capacity to do it, like, we can go affect real change. And they were getting so frustrated that everything they put on the table wasn't 
moving forward and that every effort they made to try to make these new changes occur was being thwarted. And so we started to look into this a bit more. And when we sat down with the sea level executives, they said, look, you have to realize from our perspective, our swan song is a elegant and smooth transition of power post merger. And we're all finishing our careers. We've got three years left by and large before we all hit our different various stages of retirement. We're not making big bets. We're not taking this place on a 180. Our legacy is the, is the, is the transition and the merger being completed. If someone who takes our position in a few years wants to take big bets, that's fine. That's going to be up to them. But right now, you know, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to transition this into one complete and integrated organization. And that had not been communicated out of the C-suite. And so everyone else who thought that this was an opportunity for big seismic change realized, oh, actually, we've got to be patient because there's another job to do that we weren't aware of that the leadership is working on now. So it, communication sounds like it's an important part of the applied empathy between the different stakeholders and, and players. Yeah, and, and recognizing that uh, you know, your goals may not be their goals, right? And so uh, like we had a client who will certainly remain nameless, but we met them the first meeting we had with them. They said, you see this uh, bookshelf behind me? I want it to have three more trophies on it by the time we're done working together. And, and we said, oh, okay. So like really this entire piece of work we're, we're here to talk about is really just about sort of putting your successes in the spotlight and getting you some awards. And that's fine that we knew that on day one, but had we not been told that, you know, the, we, we could have put our efforts into a, a litany of other things. Um, suffice it to say that that project was not one that I think uh, we, were, we were too enthused to dive into and ultimately didn't end up working with them, but um, but because our interests weren't aligned. But but the 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 point was, you know, they were very clear about what they wanted, and I think that's a good thing in any organization. Um, we've worked with uh, the hedge fund uh, Bridgewater uh, for a couple of years, and they're famous for their very extreme culture. Um, Ray Dalio, their their chairman, wrote a book called uh, Principles recently, which goes into their culture. And one of the things that they've referred to their culture as is as a quote unquote magnet, because magnets do a very good job at attracting. They also do a very good job at repelling. And I think a good culture should do that. It should attract the right people and it should signal to the wrong people quickly and clearly, this might not be a place for you. I love that. Like, the magnet, the culture magnet and the attraction and, and the repel piece. And I think that we yeah. could do more of that is we're communicating to new hires and candidates through the process about what our culture is really like. So those folks that aren't the right fit, they can find somewhere else to go. That's right. Let's take a bit of a reset. This is Jessica Miller Merrill, and you're listening to the Workology podcast sponsored by Clear Company. We're talking about leading with empathy in the workplace. Today, we're talking with Michael Ventura. This podcast is sponsored by Clear Company, the fastest growing talent management system on the market, and recently won G2 Crowd's number one user recommended winter 2018 award. Visit clearcompany.com to learn more. You know, I do want to touch on design thinking again and kind of this creativity piece, because this is something that I have been talking a lot about in the HR and recruiting space is leveraging this sort of empathetic point of view to really understand and let HR or leaders walk in the shoes of our candidates or employees. Can you talk a little bit about after empathy, what maybe the most important aspect of design thinking is that you think we should be applying in our workplaces? Yeah, for sure. So for me, one of the, and this may seem obvious, I don't know, like to, to me, some organizations who are not that familiar with design thinking, um, this, this may not be, but, uh, but to me, what design thinking often refers to as solution focused thinking, right? It's, it's distinct in some ways from problem focused thinking right solution focused thinking is about looking at where the solution intersects our understanding of the problem and our needs as an organization and sometimes you can solve a problem but not create a solution right it, sometimes and i'm sure you've seen this in other organizations you fix the the leak 
but you know the leak pops up somewhere else, right? Because you've 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 microcosmically looked at the the near or, or sort of the, the most obvious uh, symptom and solved the symptom, but you haven't gone to the root cause. And so I think one of the big things that I, that I spend a lot of time on with our clients is looking at finding the root causes and developing solutions that cure those so that the other symptomatic issues cure themselves. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Where can people go to learn more about you and, and the work that you're doing? Uh, AppliedEmpathy.com gives you a good a good rundown of a lot of this. And then, of course, uh, WeAreSubRosa.com will give you a little more detail into some of, the, some of the case history and work we've done for our clients. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. This by far is one of my favorite interviews. It's a fascinating discussion with Michael. He has such a passion for being a change agent and for leading today's workplaces and lives with empathy. Michael's company, Subrosa, has worked with some of the world's largest brands and startups from GE to Nike to City, Adobe to TED and the United Nations and even the White House. Michael has served as a board member and advisor of a variety of organizations, including Behance, Burning Man, the Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and the United Nations, affiliated with the Tribal Link Foundation. He's also a visiting lecturer at Princeton University in West Point. It goes on and on and on. He is truly a gem, and I'm so excited for him to be a part of the podcast. I hope that he has given you some new insights into empathy and how we can really help our leaders be more empathetic or maybe even ourselves be more empathetic to our employees and our workplaces and leverage some of these frameworks, whether it's empathy and or design thinking in our lives and workplaces. Thank you for joining the Workology podcast sponsored by Clear Company. This podcast is for the empathetic and disruptive workplace leader who's tired of the status quo. This is Jessica Miller Merrill. Until next time, you can visit workology.com to listen to previous Workology podcast episodes.